Good afternoon and welcome to the fourth and final episode of Pipelines 101. I'm Shelley Robbins, Energy and State Policy Director for Upstate Forever. We're an environmental advocacy nonprofit that serves the 10 county upstate region of South Carolina. We work to balance growth with natural resource protection. With me today is Katie Hodel, who is Upstate Forever's GIS manager and also David Sly, Conservation Director at Wild Virginia. Wild Virginia is a nonprofit based out of Charlottesville that works to preserve and support the complexity, diversity, and stability of natural ecosystems by enhancing connectivity, water quality, and climate in the forests, mountains, and waters of Virginia through education and advocacy. So why are we here? Um, and if you're with us for the fourth time, um, you've heard this before, but you'll hear it again. Um, in 2016, Dominion Resources proposed a 55 mile natural gas pipeline that would impact four upstate South Carolina counties and more than 70 stream and river crossings, including some areas upstate forever had identified as conservation focus areas. We intervened in the certificate proceeding and were represented by the South Carolina Environmental Law Project and specifically by Michael Corley, who presented an overview of the FERC process in episode one. We also benefited from the talents of David Sly uh, on the 401 certification, and he presented episode two. And we were also helped by Upstate Forever's own GIS manager, Katie Hoddle, and both of them are here today. Ultimately, that pipeline was granted a Certificate of Public Convenience and Necessity by FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. It was built and is now in service, but it caused significant problems along the way. We recognize that given the current market and regulatory structure, there will probably be many additional natural gas pipelines proposed in the Southeast. And so we want to share what we've learned. The, um, we, when we intervened, we had no background at all in natural gas pipeline regulation and had a very steep learning curve. Um, but we learned as we went along and once we were finished, we realized that other communities could benefit from a crash course on this issue. So we're recording each webinar and making the recordings as well as the PDF slide deck available on our website. And we'll try to make it easily searchable on the internet as well. And we're also gonna add um, additional documents to that website as we find them. Um, you know, Additional presentations that other folks have done, papers that have been written, things like that, that would um, help a community um, facing a, a pipeline. The series was made possible by funding from a private donor, and we are truly grateful for that. So episode one was an overview of the relevant statutes, such as the Natural Gas Act, NEPA, and others, and the FERC certificate process, as well as a lesson in navigating the FERC website. Episode two was a deeper dive on the nationwide 12 permit and 401 water quality certification. Episode three was an overview of natural gas pipeline construction and what different water body crossing techniques look like, as well as some common problems. And we explained decatherms and how you can use them to fully understand how big a pipeline is just beyond its diameter and what size demand it's meant to serve. And then you can use this understanding to, to determine for yourself if capacity need actually exists. We talked about natural gas exports and prices Exports are increasingly driving pipeline construction, and experts believe that exports will drive domestic gas prices up in the long run. And we gave a quick tutorial on how to find national energy infrastructure on the EIA website. And in this final episode, we will talk about eminent domain and conservation easements, the impact pipelines have on timber properties, and I'll share some right-of-way contract best practices that our upstate timber owners were able to negotiate. Katie will share the GIS process that we used in order to identify all the property owners along our 55-mile pipeline, and we use that information to, com to communicate with them regarding their rights, as well as to make sure that they were aware of some meetings and input opportunities, and it, it, it functioned as a way to connect them to each other. And David Sly will share some of the various monitoring tools and programs that other communities can learn from and use. Now, if you have questions as we go along, you can type those questions in the question box on the drop-down menu on your right. 
And we will get started. That's me. Uh, I'm the Energy and State Policy Director at Upstate Forever. Now, conservation easements. Um, Upstate Forever is a land trust also. So we hold conservation easements on properties. Um, we also, um, we haven't had the, the pipeline didn't necessarily impact um, any of our easements, but it has in other places. So, but the natural gas, a lot of people, when they put a property under easement, they expect that it will be fully protected. Um, and for uh, eminent domain, it is not. And specifically, the Natural Gas Act authorizes the use of eminent no domain once a certificate is granted. Um, and that was affirmed by um, a, a big, uh, a really important case called Kilo, everybody just calls it Kilo for short, that affirmed that economic development is a permissible public purpose sufficient to justify taking private property rights through eminent domain. That was a split, almost a split decision on the Supreme Court back in 2005. It was a five to four vote. So it was pretty close, but it still holds. Now, one interesting sort of um, side opinion, there's um, uh, Professor Gerald Korngold at, the New, at New York Law School. Um, he has written uh, extensively on eminent domain. He says it's, it's especially necessary in the case of conservation easements when private arrangements such as conservation easements frustrate an essential public need. Now, people can have different opinions. This might also have implications for um, solar farms in the future. So this, this is an opinion out there that um, um, a lot of folks cite. It's not a court opinion, but it's, it's a professional opinion that a lot of folks cite. So it's just a, a different way to look at it. Now there was a case, um, I'll go through one example and show you what happened. The Nature Conservancy in the Mountain Valley Pipeline. Um, here's, uh, it involved what the, what was called the Waltz Conservation Easement. Um, you can see sort of a map of it, and then that um, there, the east property is surrounded by the the green line, and then the pipeline, the or the, what they call the disturbance area for the pipeline, is that kind of dark brown line running through there, um, and you can see things like access roads also, which are part of the disturbance area. We talked about access roads um, in the previous episode and of the different parts of the pipeline. So they had a pipeline basically going right through um, one of their easements uh, in the Bottom Creek watershed. And so in the Mountain Valley Pipeline uh, docket, which was CP 16-13, the Nature Conservancy filed after the certificate. Uh, they they had worked through the EIS process, and I think they got some some slight movement of the pipeline through that process, but it still wound up going, you know, pretty much straight through the property. So they filed, they among others, filed a request for a rehearing of the certificate order, um, and a request for a stay. They did that on November 13th, 2017. And then in June, FERC denied that request. Um, and they went through, you know, they said the Nature Conservancy argues the commission violated NEPA and the Administrative Procedures Act by failing to respond to its argument that the MP MVP project route would violate the terms of a conservation easement. Um, they said, though, that the commission is not required to conclude that an easement between private parties requires altering the pipeline route. So as was said in both episodes one and two, NEPA is pretty much procedural. Um, it, you have, it, it requires um, talking to each other, but it doesn't require that anybody actually do anything. So that is the bad news on conservation easements. You can negotiate on mitigate, mitigation. Um, and if you know, most pipeline companies don't really want to go through conservation easements, um, but there are going to be instances where they just do. So basically, you just negotiate um, as much as you can, but ultimately, FERC is not going to stand behind you on this. Now, some of these might ultimately be appealed 
to the circuit courts and we'll see what judgments come out of those um, but right now this is where things stand timber there are a lot of issues we learned um, and in the southeast we have a lot of timber properties um, and they're big and they are um, very attractive for pipeline companies because they are just large swaths of land that are easy to just go straight through and they don't have to negotiate with a whole bunch of owners. So timber properties are going to be, um, if they're anywhere near um, the pipeline alignment or the route, they're going to be a popular target. But you don't have to take the first um, offer on uh, what uh, when they come knocking at your door talking about the right-of-way um, uh, contract. You can negotiate on allowed uses. Um, do you want to be able to use that right-of-way for um, uh, all-terrain vehicles, for hunting, um, you know, driveways? Um, so you need, you know, these are all the things that timber and forestry property owners need to think about before they negotiate. Timber losses, when they cut down those trees, who who is going to pay um, those timber losses? You can negotiate that. Who's going to clear the cut timber? Um, that's something to think about. Hunting rights. Um, those are typically a very big deal in the southeast. Um, what structures are allowed in the right of way? And one thing I've seen is that the um, you can have a, um, a, a hunting structure in the right of way, but it has to be on uh, sled <laughs> so that it can be moved. It can't be anchored to the ground. Um, so that was one thing I've seen. Um, you can negotiate if your property is big enough and you have enough power, you can negotiate time restrictions um, such as no construction activity during hunting season. Um, I saw one property owner who basically negotiated time restrictions and then when they, when the, the pipeline company um, cut into those time restrictions, they were forced to pay a penalty to the to the property owner. Forester supervision. Now, if you've got construction going through your timber property, and you might want your forester uh, on site to supervise, to make sure that they don't, you know, do anything they're not supposed to do. They don't go outside the approved right of way. So who pays for that forester to be there? I've seen um, uh, an easement where the pipeline company had to pay for the forester to be uh, on the site to monitor. Access gates, uh, who, where will they be located on the property and who gets keys to those access gates? Um, is it just strictly the timber owner and the pipeline? Prescribed burns. Um, I also saw one that said the property owner can, can conduct, and they specifically laid it out, can conduct prescribed burns. Um, but, you know, what the notification process would have to be for that. And then restoration specifications. Um, what, what do they have to do to um, protect the property? Do you want them to segregate soils and then, then put the topsoil back in place? Um, do they need to replant it with a, a specific um, type of grass? Um, all these things can be negotiated in uh, timber. Uh, right of way. Other issues, where, uh, what can go in the pipeline? How long can it sit abandoned before the right of way revert, ownership reverts back? And what else can go in the right of way? So some language that I've seen on what can go in the pipeline, I've seen that the pipeline is for transportation of natural gas only, and that's the most restrictive. You might want to include this language if you don't want it converted at some later date to uh, a, a liquid petroleum pipeline, which has been done in other parts of the country. So you can um, put that language in or transportation of water uh, and gases, and that covers the hydrostatic testing that they do. They blow water through it before um, they put it in service to test it. So those two are what you would want, the language you would want if you want to make sure that they can't repurpose that pipeline for some other product. How long can it be abandoned before reverting? Uh, five years, from what I've seen, appears to be the standard language, but I have seen as short as 18 months negotiated. So basically the, 
the property owner owner said that if if you abandon this pipeline if this event as pipeline is unused for 18 months then you have to notify me and you, we have to start the process of reverting the right of way back to me um, and you know you do see pipelines abandoned um, periodically when they you know decide they want to have a, a different route or something so that does happen and then what else can go in the right of way and some language i've seen and this is where you control okay is it just this one pipeline what if they want to put in a second pipeline um, this is where you you control what they can do um, language i've seen has included a pipeline of the same size and capacity and appurtenances a pipeline of similar or different size and appurtenance appurtenances and a single pipeline as authorized by the certificate which basically means you can't replace it just this one pipeline that's it nothing more so um, those that is some um, language that I've seen in our uh, upstate timber um, easements now this is an interesting issue I had not considered and that is timber truck crossings so uh, the they, um, the pipeline builder typically does not want timber trucks because of how incredibly heavy they are to cross um, perpendicular to their pipeline and in many instances they want the property owner to be responsible for uh, fortifying or uh, you know, building up or building a bridge or whatever for uh, any uh, timber truck movement however I have seen a property owner make the pipeline company do that and the language they used they basically marked a couple of um, locations on their property on a map and they said basically exhibit a shows the locations of the points on the right of way where provisions shall have been made for the safe crossing of the certified facilities by logging trucks and other vehicles they didn't spell out who um, will make those provisions but the implication is that it is the um, uh, the, the pipeline builder so that too is a, an important issue and now I'm going to turn it over to Katie and uh, Katie is going to give you a, a, a walk walk everybody through how uh, how we um, identify the property owners so that we could talk to them and, co and connect them and connect them to DHEC um, as well for some meetings because we FOIA'd the list of property owners along the easement and um, uh, FERC said um, FERC and the pipeline said nope that's confidential we're not going to give it to you so we got it a different way. Katie? Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in today. Um, like Shelly said, my name is Katie Hoddle and I am the GIS coordinator for Upstate Forever. I have been with the organization for almost six years now and I'm excited to tell you a little bit about what I did with um, the Dominion Pipeline Project. When we first got the Dominion Pipeline proposed route, it was in a PDF and there were 17 pages that displayed the route's 55 miles through the upstate and it was really difficult to see the entirety of the route since it was so segmented on so many different pages and in order to really analyze the pipeline's route and its possible impacts we decided it was necessary to figure out a way to view the route all in one view at a time Shelly, if you could go to the next page so this is where the GIS mapping platform came in handy. Without going into too much technical detail, I was able to use the georeferencing tool within ArcGIS to convert the lines that were shown on the PDF into map features that we could then use to map the route ourselves. So simply speaking, these PDFs can be thought of as images with no association to any location in physical space. So you can't simply pull in a PDF to the mapping platform and assume that the program knows where in the world it is. And so our goal was to use the coordinate system of the map to relate the PDFs to physical space using geographical coordinates and associating the PDF images with spatial locations. Next slide, please. So I'll show you an example of this in a minute, um, but we essentially used geographical points of interest such as roads, road crossings or intersections 
uh, rivers and contour lines. And I was able to associate the same points of interest on the PDF to their physical location and space. Um, so in order for this to be successful, you need multiple points of interest. Next slide. These images show you how that works. In the image on the left side of the screen, you can see that I was able to use the South and North Tiger Rivers as a point of reference to associate the PDFs with their true life location. And the same thing goes for highways, major roads um, that we could see on the PDF. Uh, I was able to use those locations to pinpoint exactly where that PDF was displaying. Oftentimes these points of interest will cause the PDFs to rotate to their actual orientation, which is why you don't see them lining up perfectly. Um, there's overlap between the PDFs and they aren't all shown in the document with the north arrow pointing up. Next slide. So once all of the PDFs were in GIS and in their proper locations in physical space, I traced the pipeline route in GIS, which saves the route as a physical location instead of an image. Um, and then when you remove the PDF from the mapping platform, which is what you see in the image on the right side, you're left with a physical route that can be then used in a variety of ways. Next slide. One really unique way that we were able to utilize the route's physical location was to identify which parcels and properties the proposed route would go through and pull the names of all of the landowners and property owners for some outreach efforts. To do this, I pulled each of the county's GIS parcel data. This information is publicly available um, on most of county's GIS websites, but you have to look at parcels one by one, which can be really time consuming. So in order to look at all of them at the same time, you have to purchase, it, purchase that data in most cases from the county, and um, then you can use that on your own computer and mapping platform. This option is not really a great one for any non-GIS users or the general public, because it can be pretty expensive to purchase, let alone purchase from more than one county. Um, this is data that Upstate Forever uses for a lot of our other projects. So we usually purchase the parcel data from each of our 10 counties in our focus area on an annual basis, so we already had that data in our system. You can't use these data sets in Google Maps or Google Earth either because of how large they are in size. All right, Shelly, next slide. So the map on the right of the screen shows all of the parcels um, in purple that the proposed route would go through. This gave us an idea of how many landowners would be affected by the proposed route and if any of those parcels were under conservation easements or of significant ecological value. Um, so you can kind of see the different, the differing size of all of the parcels along the route. All right, Shelly. So from that map that I just showed you, we pulled the names and addresses of all the landowners that were adjacent to the proposed pipeline route and sent a postcard out with the hopes of mobilizing support for fighting the route and sharing information with those who might not have even known the um, pipeline was proposing to come through their backyard. So by using GIS to target the adjacent landowners, we were seeking to inform those that would be directly affected. Next slide. So this is an image of the postcard that we sent out to landowners. So the front had some details about an information session um, that DHEC was holding, and the back showed a map of the proposed route. And you can see that it's going through three of Upstate Forever's um, focus area counties. Next slide. The result of this work was the targeted outreach to 165 property owners who would be directly crossed by the proposed route in three of our counties. Um, so this really allowed us to garner support for fighting the pipeline and educate and inform landowners about how the route, 
the route would directly affect them um, and identify any environmental impacts the pipeline would have in our region. Uh, so GIS was really powerful in this case, and it was a great example of the impact that um, GIS can have on the outcome of a project. So Shelley, that's all I have. Okay, thank you, Katie. And Katie will stick around if there are questions um, at the end. And now, monitoring. Um, what could possibly go wrong with a pipeline? Well, lots of things. Um, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, or last, uh, last episode on Monday. Um, what you see here is our um, upstate South Carolina Dominion pipeline, uh, massive erosion control failure. Um, and threats to both water and to safety. And so for monitoring, I'm going to turn it over to David Sly, who has uh, up in Virginia, they have some incredible resources up there and they've done some amazing work on those huge pipeline projects up there. Um, David? All right. Thank you. Um, as Shelley said, I've been working pretty intensively on two big pipeline projects, the Mountain Valley Pipeline and Atlantic Coast Pipeline, both of which are proposed to come from the fracking fields in West Virginia, uh, way into Virginia. The Mountain Valley Pipeline goes part of the way across. Atlantic Coast Pipeline would go all the way to the far southeast corner of Virginia and then into North Carolina and maybe down into uh, South Carolina, um, although they don't want to admit that at this point. Anyhow, uh, next slide, please. Monitoring is important and useful, but as with all kinds of projects like this, I think it's important to think right up front, what are you trying to accomplish with monitoring? Uh, so knowing up front what your goals are, uh, what you think it will be useful for is going to help you design it in a way that makes sense. Uh, certainly with our projects, and I think with any project, uh, as Shelley has shown, you know, there's going to be damage to the land and, and water quality problems. Uh, but there could be a wide range of, of problems that would show up. And so, of course, one thing is to be a watchdog and try to insist that all of the regulators who have responsibility actually do their jobs. Uh, that includes everybody from FERC to state agencies or other federal agencies like the Forest Service or, or others who may have uh, some responsibilities. Um, public exposure of the problems. I mean, sometimes, uh, you can make, a lot of you probably understand, you can make complaints to regulators um, all you want, and it might not get results until you bring it out in the public and embarrass them enough uh, that they feel like they have to respond. You can also have some impact on the companies themselves in that circumstance if the company cares about its public image. Uh, I'll tell you that Mountain Valley Pipeline here uh, doesn't really seem to care about that. So we haven't had any uh, success in um, embarrassing them of their bad about their bad behavior. But then finally, uh, there is a possibility, of course, for citizens to be the enforcers themselves, uh, especially through Clean Water Act citizen suits. I will say that another thing that we did here, and I, I served as an expert witness on a case where three landowners brought a trespass case against Mountain Valley Pipeline because essentially by pouring its mud onto people's land, their farm fields, and into their streams, that is a trespass. And there's a possibility for, for uh, private civil action there. Um, one other thing that I think monitoring can be useful for, and I didn't list it here, is that we really hope that it can, through time, have a little bit of a deterrent value on pipeline companies, knowing that they're going to be watched really closely and really intensively, um, I think in, in the long run might have some 
some influence on where they want to build pipelines and when they want to build pipelines. I'm not saying that by itself is going to be sufficient to stop them, but I think it will be uh, a factor in their minds. Um, next, please. Um, so, of course, again, water quality problems are something that are pretty much sure to to uh, be experienced when you come to building and even maintaining and operating pipelines. Uh, one of the things, of course, that we've experienced is that a lot of the streams that would be affected by these two pipelines are of very high quality. Some of them are uh, what are called tier three or exceptional waters uh, here in Virginia so that you're not supposed to have any degradation at all. Many of them have uh, really rare communities, endangered threatened species, all those kinds of things. And they have extraordinary uh, habitats and physical characteristics. And so you want to start as soon as you think something might be affecting your water bodies to go out and prove what high quality you have what kind of circumstances exist so that if things happen later to do damage, that you can show that those water bodies have been damaged. That will be important, especially if you're able to go into a, to a water quality or a Clean Water Act citizen suit. But it's, it's a good idea in any case because you want to be able to show that contrast. Um, here, on the two big pipelines, we started monitoring in 2016, uh, and neither pipeline had approval to do any construction, uh, even timber removal, until early this year, 2018. So we have plenty of background data. Now, of course, there are other sources of background data, including stream monitoring that your state does, uh, U.S. Geological Survey and others. So gathering that, figuring out how you can supplement it or add to it, um, or fill in gaps in places that that where that's necessary. Um, you got if you're going to be credible, obviously you got to train people. Uh, you got to continue to work with them and make sure that they're doing the right thing. Uh, Quality control can mean checking the results of what they do. For example, if they're doing turbidity monitoring, uh, that maybe they, in addition to their field monitoring, you send samples to a lab once a year or on a certain frequency for quality control, or possibly the, the experts go out there with them periodically and do quality control, make sure that they're on the right track. And there are different levels of expertise that can be useful. Everybody from, from the person who has not done this at all, but whom you can give fairly basic training and allow them to be useful, but also, you know, a, a range of different choices we have kind of on the Atlantic Coast Pipeline um, monitoring program, we have a bunch of people who have expertise who are academics, researchers, former government people who are, can be recognized as experts in the fields. And we've even bought uh, equipment for them to be kind of first responders on some of the big problems that we might see. Next. Um, this is uh, a um, portal or a link to something called Adopt-A-Stream. A lot of you probably know about it, and I think most states have this, but, you know, it's an important program that already exists where citizens get out and monitor their streams. And so tying into that, knowing about where they monitor and being able to use their results or uh, recruiting some of the folks who are in that to be in your kind of specialized program uh, could could be possible. 
And I'm going to mention another program that I didn't manage to get on a slide, but there's something called Save Our Streams. It's uh, operated by the Isaac Walton League. And it's similar, I guess, to adopt the stream programs. But in this case, uh, the Isaac Walton League teaches people to do benthic macroinvertebrate sampling in streams. And again, we've been able to work with them here uh, in some cases to take people who have been trained in that process who are doing monitoring uh, on other in other places and they've agreed to come over and do some of the some of the stream sites that are really of interest to us. So there, there are resources like that out there. Next. And I'm I'm going to interject on this one. This is these are the adopt a stream locations in South Carolina, the current ones, and um, the, you see they are clustered in the Upstate because I'm proud to say Upstate Forever got this going in South Carolina um, before we turned it over to DHEC and Clemson. Um, but what I'm seeing on this map is a pretty big gap in the PD and the Low Country region, and you know, really for, and that's probably in South Carolina, that's where the next pipelines are going to be. So, you know, I would advise looking at this type of data in each state. I know that Georgia has this program as well um, and see where the gaps are, see where, you know, where it's, where it's likely for pipelines to be. And this is one um, tool, the adopt stream program for um, stream monitoring. You, you learn how, as citizen scientists, you learn how to assess the physical and chemical health of a stream. You measure bacteria and then macroinvertebrates. So South Carolina needs to get on it, um, as do other states, I'm sure. It's just one tool. Yeah, yeah that's that's a great note is that, like I say, you, you, you figure out what's going on out there, but as early as possible, start figuring out how to fill the gaps. And one of the things that we figured out is that folks who have signed up and are trained through uh, these different processes, we have a very specific process just for the pipelines. Uh, in addition to folks who do the, uh, the, the more established programs. But some of those folks, I think, are going to want to keep doing this in the long term, because even if you stop a pipeline or even if a pipeline gets built, and you've you've you know documented what happened there. Um, there may be things in the future that you want that those folks out there in the streams to document, and so that's a great thing. One other thing to note is that there are funders out there who will give you money to do this. Um, again, if you want to train people for your own specialized water quality monitoring. I'm going to talk, uh, well, go on to the next slide. Um, you see what we have here. Uh, there is a protocol kind of uh, for folks that Trout Unlimited and the West Virginia Rivers Coalition have put together. Um, it's not chemical monitoring or chemical sampling or um, uh, physical habitat work but it's really visual assessments of what's going on around the pipeline and whether they're doing the kind of uh, pollution controls they're supposed to, to do. But at the same time, Trout Unlimited, West Virginia Rivers, and Wild Virginia have had, as I said, an ongoing program since 2016 where we do train people to go out there and do physical habitat assessments, uh, things like turbidity and temperature and other basic water quality measures and some uh, some lab testing. And so that's been going on for quite a while. And as I say, we've gotten funding for that. And we've also gotten funding for buying equipment, not only for those folks, for the citizen monitors, but for our experts who have joined in. Um, now, I'm kind of making the transition here from strictly water quality to more just visual observations of what's happening out on the ground. Uh, they can overlap, obviously, but there are some folks who are not going to want to be trained or don't feel like they have the expertise or the time or whatever else. But 
once activities start out there on the ground, their eyes and ears and voices are going to matter because there's a wide range of things that they can see and help report and maybe stop some of the damage that would happen otherwise. Um, and again, that goes all the way from the folks who are there, the landowners to uh, local community groups, but sometimes even local governments. Uh, unfortunately, here in Virginia, the way the, the rules have been set up, the state has some enforcement authority in regard to the water quality assessments and water quality certification, but they just completely cut localities out of the whole process. Um, local governments aren't happy about that because they they care about looking out for their own streams in a lot of cases, and they're used to doing it uh, for other kinds of construction projects. So you might you might get some help from them. Um, but again, when it comes to visual impacts, this source here, this link to the uh, training that, that uh, Trout Unlimited and others put together is a really good kind of primer as to what you're looking for out there on a pipeline site. Of course, the pipeline project is like a lot of construction projects in some ways, but there's certainly uh, unique uh, activities and unique problems that you might see. Um, one of the problems, of course, is that you might be able to see what's going on from a public road or from a private landowner's uh, viewpoint. Uh, certainly, you can't get into the right-of-way or to certain restricted areas. And just basically the terrain that they're going through, a lot of times it's going to keep you from being able to see all that you need to see. Now, one thing that is pertinent to the stream stuff, both for quality monitoring and for just the visual observations, of course, is you want to see when there's impact to the stream. And if it's possible, looking both upstream and downstream is what you really need to do. And you need to do that as close as possible to the activity that you think is causing the problem so that you can bracket it and you can prove that that's the source of the problems. Um, I, I was really glad to hear about the landowner records and the, and the uh, you know, having the plats and where people live, because again, those folks uh, are going to be a valuable source. They're probably going to be looking out for their land anyway, and to to work with you, a lot of them are going to be excited to do that. Now, we have found that instead of a conservation group showing up at their front door, if we get one neighbor or one uh, landowner in the neighborhood, uh, they're the best diplomat. They're the best person to go to their neighbors and say, hey, you should help with this too. And I'll note that it's not just folks who have been fighting the projects all along. Some folks uh, willingly signed an easement, or maybe not willingly, but they did it early on because they thought they couldn't get a better deal. Or maybe they have not been vocal, but of course they still want to protect their places. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so again, going back to the idea that there are places you're just not going to be able to get to easily on the ground. And I'll note that even our state regulators here who are supposed to be out there uh, inspecting pipeline work and looking at the effects, they're telling us that in, in a lot of places they're not getting to certain sites because they, they haven't gone to the trouble to ask the landowners to use their property which would be the best way to get some of those places. And um, so in any case, it's important to have other sources or other, other methods. And aerial surveillance is something that we have found extremely valuable. To be able to show places that you couldn't get to otherwise is great, but it's also a viewpoint that you can, that, that really catches people's attention. Um, South Wings is a wonderful organization. It's somebody that I've worked with for years and who has started to help us on these pipelines. 
we are lucky that we have had some volunteer pilots outside of South Wings. We, we've always worked in collaboration with them and been in contact with them since the very beginning. But we've got a couple pilots who live in the area and who are just completely dedicated to this thing. Uh, one guy does flights pretty much every week if weather allows. Um, and then we have drone operators. We have some who are directly connected with our conservation groups, our opposition groups, and they have done at least, I would say, half a dozen trainings where they get 20 or 30 people to show up. And a lot of those people are going out and buying their own drones. So there's an awful lot of willingness to get out there. I think, I think the, and the surveillance, the, we call on the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, we call our group the Pipeline Air Force. And I will tell you that quickly got into the media and got a lot of attention. So again, there's, there's the value of getting the information and being able to use it, but there's also the fact that you're making known that you're out there and you're watching closely and that probably you're seeing more than the regulators are going to see. Next, please. Um, I just, yeah, I just wanted to show the South Wing. South Wings flew us twice on ours and they were absolutely amazing. Um, and this is, if, if you go to the website, it's fascinating, but it's just this easy to request a flight. Um, and they operate in the Southeast. So it's, a, a, I can't say enough good things about that organization. Absolutely. And uh, they just flew me over a pretty big section of the Mountain Valley Pipeline route several weeks ago uh, on two different flights where I was able to accompany some reporters. And again, these folks, some of them had been writing about the pipeline for, for years, for a couple years. And it was astounding to them to see some of the things they were able to, to really understand some of the threats and some of the problems that we had been telling them about. Uh, but then there were others who had kind of vaguely known about the pipelines and were just kind of aghast to see what was happening and the terrain over which they wanted to, to do this construction. So, and then the other thing I think is, can be important, especially if you do it earlier on, is to get decision makers up there. If you can get state legislators, if you can get your governor, if you can get other people who may be able to raise their voice against these things and show them what kind of terrain you're looking at and what you have to, to save, that could be really important. Next. Okay, this gives you a link to what I've been talking about on the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. We've called this our Pipeline Compliance Surveillance Initiative, CSI. Uh, there again, that's gotten a lot of people's attention. Uh, it wasn't my invention. I, I kind of thought it was a little cutesy to begin with, but it's useful because it gets people's attention. Um, and we have an amazing array of different folks who have put together our program as far as citizen monitoring and the tools with which to follow up on that monitoring, to compile it. Uh, we have a really sophisticated system through which you can find all the photographs that have been taken from, from the flights and from drones. Uh, a place where you can access any of the complaints that have been made, any reports that we put out. And so it, it's not only a good place to learn about monitoring and, and what the components can be, which is part of the reason I, I recommend it here, but it shows you a lot about what you can actually do with that information once you get it. Um, and again, we've, we've got great GIS people. We've got uh, experts in a lot of different fields. And this is just another place where we've been able to get really good funding. And we think that our system is going to be uh, a model that a lot of people can, can use. Next. And to prove that, the Mountain Valley Watch uh, which is a separate group on the, that pipeline, did actually use the CSI system as a bit of a guide 
in setting up their own their own website, their own interactive project process, and their own monitoring systems. Now there are differences, and that makes sense because there are different folks running it and different stuff. But frankly, I would advise you if you want to think about how to how to approach this kind of process to to go to both of those websites and see see what they have in common. You, I'm sure you'll you'll find some ideas that never would have occurred to you otherwise. Every every time I look at one of these sites, I think about things that you know I'm kind of thrilled that somebody has figured out. Next. Um, that's just a little bit more of the kind of stuff that's on their pipeline, just to show it. Right. Well, and and just it can you go back real quick? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just you'll see on data discovery there there is you know one one portal for that, and like I was describing for CSI, they essentially have the reports and the photographs of every single complaint that they've made. And on that one, which is much further along than the Atlantic Coast Pipeline here in Virginia, they've made hundreds of reports and hundreds of observations of problems. Next. Uh, there we go. Um, yeah, there's, you know, there are resources for making complaints. Um, these are some of them, especially through FERC and the federal agencies. You will want, of course, uh, identify where your states and other other agencies come in, and you know where you can reach them, how you can best give them the information. We've worked hard to collaborate with them to the extent of saying what's the form in which we can give you this stuff that you're going to be able to use it best? Will we use forms that you have or uh, will you accept, you know, our specific kind of report or whatever? But that's just, that's the, the end, on the end of using what you gather through monitoring. Thanks. All right. Um, and as I said, I'm this the that pipelines dash one oh one web landing page on the Upstate Forever website is going to become an archive of all four webinars as well as additional information as I find it. Um, other organizations, um, uh, PowerPoints that have been helpful, um, different uh, white papers, anything I can find that I think would be of use to a community that I would have found useful <laughs> a couple of years ago, um, we're gonna put it there. Um, David and Katie, did y'all, I don't see any questions. Um, are there any questions? If anybody has any, type now or forever hold your peace. Well, it, while we're waiting, I made a couple notes to myself here just while I was rambling on. And I, I mentioned a couple things. One is that, of course, if you're out there doing your own monitoring, uh, it's, you know, there are other folks who are supposed to be out there doing inspections and monitoring, including FERC, including your state agencies and, and possibly others. And you can use the reports that they put out. They will, um, they will usually put, uh, submit those to the FERC docket online. And sometimes they may, both the companies themselves and the FERC inspectors, and they will contract with inspectors to be out there. And sometimes they can help clue you in, uh, help you uh, find the right direction as to where you can find uh, the problems. Uh, they might well, that, have, go ahead. In, in, our, in our case though, none of the problems that we found showed up on the yeah. biweekly reports or in the inspection reports until we um, brought them to light. So yeah. in, including including one pretty serious uh, erosion situation that, you know, a, a pipeline inspector, it, it had existed the entire, yeah, I, I went back and I looked at my aerial photos and I f something that I had found 
after the pipeline was already in service, I went back and looked at my aerial photos and there it was, a, a gully um, yeah. that was eroding into the right of way. And it had been there the whole time. And it is a threat to the integrity of the pipeline. And it never showed up until you know we pointed it out. Well, and I, yeah, I don't suggest that to say that they're going to be adequate or, or accurate or complete, um, but they, they can be useful in one way. The other thing is that if the company is out there and they're supposed to be issuing these reports, these activity reports, and if you find things that they did not report, then that could well be a violation of their of their license itself and you can call them on that we found a problem we found activity going on before construction was supposed to happen at all and this activity was clearly construction they put in some roads some bridges some other things and they had never reported that they were doing that to FERC or anybody else and so that kind of thing is valuable and again it's are they do, are they doing what they're supposed to be doing in the places where they're supposed to be uh you certainly can't take for granted that they won't be over here blasting and digging in a place that they don't have authorization to be yet uh that's going to happen um there's there's a lot of arrogance involved there and the one other thing is, you know, when you keep up with the reports, you know where they're active today and this week and next week, maybe, so that you don't, you're not spread as thin, maybe, with your monitors out there chasing up and down, trying to figure out where they are. Uh, obviously, they, they're usually not going to be building everywhere on the pipeline route at once, so you, you will want to, to target and uh, be wise as to where you put your resources. We covered um, how to navigate that FERC website um, in episode one, if you missed that. Um, and um, Katie, do you have anything to add? I don't think so. All right. Um, David, anything else? I don't think so. All right. Well, I believe this concludes um, all four of our episodes of Pipelines 101, and I hope that it has been helpful, um, whether now or someone accessing it in the future. Um, and please share this resource widely um, with any uh, person or organization you think could could use it. We we want um, this process to be as as good as it can be. Um, thank you all for joining us. And Can I add one more thing, Shelley. Yeah, oh, absolutely. First of all, I really appreciate Upstate Forever doing this and inviting me to be part of it. Uh, it's excellent. But I will say that uh, you've got my contact information there. I do consulting with other groups, and I will talk to anybody about how to fight and bulldog or uh, watchdog pipelines anytime. So contact me. Uh, I, I want to help. And it doesn't have to be as a paid consultant, although that's a possibility. But uh, Shelly will tell you that I can talk about this stuff uh, way longer than you can stand hearing me. <laughs> and, and fortunately, you, you are the expert on these issues. And thank you, David, so much for being a part of this series. Thank you, Katie. Um, and with that, we will sign off. And I will send out... Uh, the the videos with the link um probably by tomorrow it usually takes about 24 hours to turn it around and um, thank you all and have a good uh good halloween <laughs>